And then let me talk about the geology. By the way, talking about geology, you see there's a drilling here, right here. Zahir was drilled 2008, 2009. There's several of these pegs you're going to see. And interestingly, that peg right here in front of the left forepaw, that was recently opened because the last time I was here, this was capped. And now it's open. This is really interesting. Okay. What's up, everybody? NEXT here, and this is Adept Expeditions. If you are new to this channel, please subscribe now for more videos with original research and documentation on location, exploring ancient history and mysteries through an esoteric lens. And be sure to hit the bell icon to receive future notifications for more videos like this one. Today, we are cutting through the layers and exploring the geology of the eroding Sphinx of Giza. To quote AERA, that is, the Ancient Egypt Research Associates, who are responsible for conducting innovative research on ancient Egypt with a focus on Giza Plateau, arguments proposing a date for the Sphinx that is much earlier than 4th Dynasty Egypt are based on a misreading of the Giza geology. End quote. Well, as many of you are aware, geologist Dr. Robert Schock proposes a date for the Sphinx that is much earlier than 4th Dynasty Egypt. He and Thomas Dobeke performed a scientific experiment at the Sphinx called seismic refraction. What is seismic refraction and how was it used to determine the age and dating of the Sphinx? And why is it so controversial? Could other geologists be misinterpreting the data? That's what we'll cover today as we go inside the Sphinx enclosure where Dr. Manu Saifzadeh, author of Under the Sphinx and co-author of a paper with Dr. Robert Schock, explains Dr. Robert Schock and Thomas Dobeke's experiment. This is Sphinx geology made ridiculously simple. And it's what you ought to know about the seismic refraction experiment. Let's go inside the Sphinx enclosure and get into the footage. So, um, but let's talk about the geology real quick. So Robert Schock is famous for the water erosion hypothesis, as you all know. However, the main experiment they performed is seismic refraction, okay? It has been criticized by people that don't understand this experiment. I strongly recommend that you take a careful look at this paper and just familiarize yourself with the rationale of the experiment because it's a well-controlled experiment. It's really well designed. The upshot of the experiment is that when you cut rock and you expose the surface, it begins to decay immediately because it's in contact with air. And that process goes on for hundreds of years, thousands of years, right? And as the decay progresses, it slows down. So you get sort of a, what we call an exponential decay uh, kinetics, okay? And so you can use that amount of decay to date when the surface was cut, okay? And that's what they did. They cut, they ran a seismic refraction line on each side of the Sphinx and also in other areas. And what they found out is that Behind the Sphinx, the decay is about a meter. Left and right of the Sphinx, the decay is about three meters, two and a half to three meters, and in front, it's about three and a half meters, okay? So the key finding is that on this side and on that side, the decay is the same by this measurement, okay? So the data are therefore not tracking the dip of the rock layers as they sweep through this monument, okay? So you have to imagine that the Mokatam limestone has three layers, upper, middle, and lower. And these three layers are not horizontal. They're sweeping down at about a 70-degree angle from the northwest to the southeast, and right through this area here, right? And so let's, uh, let me go outside and show this to you so you can see this with your own eyes. It's a really important concept, so I wanted to make sure. So before we take a look from the ground, let's just recapitulate what we have learned thus far and discuss the Sphinx geology we are about to see by using this image here. It will help you to better visualize the layers that we are about to discuss on the ground by first reviewing this image that you can find on the AERA website. I'll leave a link for you in the description below. The organization draws from the work of Mark Lehner, who is a foremost authority on the Sphinx. 
Mark Lehner has surveyed the Sphinx stone by stone. Lehner and his team took a comprehensive inventory and identified every single stone of the Sphinx. So, like it or not, it's safe to say few people know the Sphinx better than Mark Lehner. This is someone who not only worked there on a daily basis, but whose office was between the paws of the Sphinx. So if you really want to know about the Sphinx, his thesis is the first place you should check. It's a primary source, especially if you buy into the claim that Egyptologists are hiding something, because his thesis is about as comprehensive and transparent as one can get when it comes to the Sphinx. His thesis is very long, though, and not all of you will want to be bothered reading it all, and that's where researchers such as myself and the information that you receive from channels like this matter. So the Sphinx is carved from the natural limestone of the Giza Plateau. This is known as the Mokatam Formation, and it dates back to the Eocene period some 50 million years ago when the sea levels receded. A shallow lagoon formed above a shoal and coral reef, and that is what now makes up the south-southeast part of the plateau. Over millions of years, carbonate mud petrified layer upon layer to become this stone. And it was from these stone layers at Giza, which the ancient architects quarried limestone blocks to build the pyramids, to build the temples in front of the Sphinx, and from which they carved the Sphinx itself. You can see how the Sphinx is cut from the lowest layers of the Mokatam formation. This is the layer on top of the hardest petrified reef. The Egyptologists Mark Lehner and AERA label the Sphinx geological layers member one, member two, and member three, after the work of geologist K. Lal Ghari, who published this work in 1995 after his extensive survey of the Sphinx. In this video, however, Dr. Manu Saifzadeh is using Dr. Robert Schock's standard by labeling the layers upper, middle, and lower. Now, I'm not a geologist, but I personally think labeling them by orientation with upper, middle, and lower using Dr. Robert Schock's standard, rather than by number with members one, two, and three is a better labeling convention because it reduces potential for confusion and human error that could arise from discussion. In other words, if I say members one, two, and three, you may not know whether to place the one at the top or bottom of the layer cake. Whereas if I say lower, middle, or upper, you can easily conceive a mental picture of which layer attribution is being referenced. So you can see how the geology is like a complex layer cake. It's not all horizontal, but has dips and waves with three separate levels or layers of rock strata. And then there is alternating soft and hard levels in those layers. We have member one, the lower layer, member two, the middle layer, which makes up the body of the Sphinx, and the head, which constitutes member three, the upper layer. Here you can see where member one, the lower layer, dips through the sphinx paws on the north side and then runs underground under member two, the middle layer. This is what we'll be taking a look at in just a moment while we're on the ground. Now when it comes to dating the sphinx, Everyone wants to talk about the work of John Anthony West and Dr. Robert Schock and the water erosion theory. But the water erosion is only one of Schock's key observations. The seismic refraction experiment and the data that came of that is also important to understand. But few are those who look into it and some professional geologists have challenged it. And this complexity of Sphinx geology is important to consider when looking into the controversy around the seismic experiment. Everyone looks at the water erosion theory, often overlooking the seismic experiment. Seismic refraction has been compared to have common measure with esoteric methods. But as I have pointed out in my Sphinx origins, identity, and hidden entrances video, which you can find here on my YouTube channel, it is being employed by professionals in Egypt to make important decisions. So let's get back on the ground and learn more about this experiment and its implications. So this is a great place to, to see the different rock layers. So this, all of this, what you're seeing here, is the lower member, okay? Some people call it member one, but the easiest way, like Robert Schock calls this the lower member, so the best way to remember it. Now, so that's the lower member. What you see up there the, with the famous vertical erosion is the middle member, okay? And it, as you can see, it sits above the lower member, okay? Now, you might think that 
this sweeps across horizontally to the other side, but that's not the case, okay? So I'm gonna show this to you now, walking to the other side. Sorry about the, <laughs> the wild goose chase. You can see how the, mem the middle member is basically the body of the Sphinx, right? And the head is, by the way, the upper member. So what happens is that these layers are sweeping downward, and if you look at this groove right here, okay, this is exactly where the lower member dips underground, okay, right here. Why is there a groove? Because because the lowest the lowest layer of the middle member is the weakest one. So this is actually decayed, okay. That's why there's a groove here, okay. So here is the exactly, and you can see it here, for example. That is where the lower member dips under, right? So when Schock did the experiment, Schock and Dobecki, they ran a line here, they ran a line here, and as you can see now, this is not the same rock layers, okay? These are different rock layers. Here, you're standing, you're basically standing here on the rock that you saw over there, right? Except it's higher. And so if you get the same measurement of decay, that means you're not measuring the rock layers, you're measuring the actual decay. And that is something that a lot of geologists that came here criticized Robert Schrock to Becky's experiment that they don't understand, okay? That is the most important thing for you to remember. And by all means, read the paper yourself, go through the evaluation, you be the judge, okay? But when people talk about seismic refraction and they say, oh, he was just checking, he was just measuring the dip, including Colin Reeder, for example, he's saying that experiment is just measuring the dip of the rock layers. Remember what I said, shock, check each side, got the same result, even though we're looking at completely different parts of the rock layer, okay? Thank you for watching, everyone. Leave a comment below to let us know if this video helped you better understand Sphinx geology and the seismic refraction experiment performed inside the enclosure by Dr. Robert Schock and Thomas Dobecki. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like, Share it with your friends. This video is only one part in a series of videos on Sphinx geology. I have a playlist here on my channel called The Sphinx of Egypt, which I am constantly updating with new content. On this playlist, you will find all of the videos from inside the Sphinx enclosure captured during my last tour of Egypt, featuring myself, Dr. Manu Saifzadeh, and Christopher Dunn. So please do check that out. But if you don't want to wait, the full uncut video runs for more than an hour. It's jam-packed with information inside the Sphinx enclosure, all the behind the scenes with myself, Dr. Manu Saifzadeh, and Christopher Dunn. You can get that full virtual tour video by becoming a member at ancientegyptmysteryschools.com. Ancientegyptmysteryschools.com is my private membership community where members get access to unpublished content and videos not available here on my YouTube channel or anywhere else online. Private members of Ancient Egypt Mystery Schools also get discounts on all of my Adept Expeditions tours of Egypt. I will leave a link in the description below where you can access ancientegyptmysteryschools.com. I have another tour of Egypt coming up soon that you can join, so I will leave a link to Adept Expeditions in the description below as well. And I could also use your support. I produce these videos and make this content available for free here on this YouTube channel. If you like the content that I'm creating for you, you can support by becoming a patron at Patreon. I have some real cool benefits for the various tiers and support at any level is always appreciated. So go ahead and check that out and do consider supporting the channel. I will leave a link in the description below. As I am recording this, I am still in the United States, but by the time this video is published, I will be living in Luxor. That's right, I am moving to Egypt. As many of you know, in 2021, I set out on a nationwide road trip to film my Ancient America documentary series. Upon returning home, my family and I were confronted with a disaster. We lost our home and pretty much everything we own. So we decided to move to Egypt, where we'll be starting all over. So I could really use your support at Patreon to make the efforts with this YouTube channel sustainable. 
That way I can continue doing research and producing content for you. If you are not in position to contribute financially, you can still help by sharing my videos and this channel with others. Again, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, remember to give it a like, leave a comment, and please subscribe. Until next time, this is NEXT for AdeptExpeditions.com.